I forgot no one's coming into the room. <laughs> okay, I've never done a nose stream before. Um, we'll wait about a couple of minutes then. Um, it's just loading now. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, just let us know when it's when we're live. Yeah, we're live now. Okay. <laughs> We'll do a couple of minutes so people can join the live stream. Okay, I'll start. Um, hello and welcome to the panel event behind the logo, have accreditation logo spelled workers. Uh, I am Ayesha. Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi. But, well, that, that's, that's Nav, and I'm Gareth, um, and we're from No Sweat. Um, we're a grassroots campaign group called Solidarity among workers worldwide, um, and we look at the global social justice movement and to the international workers' movement to build common united campaigning action against workplace exploitation and sweatshop bosses. So, as many of you are aware, 24 April marked the 8th anniversary of the Rana Plaza collapse, where 1,138 workers died and hundreds were injured. It symbolised capitalism and corporate greed at its worst, and the devastating consequence of those in the global south, as well as migrant workers in the north, who were reduced to cheap labour costs and profit margins and stripped of their humanity. However, they continued to fight for justice. Since then, and even prior to that, brands have gone to a large extent to show they are protecting their garment workers, sticking accreditation labels on their websites, drafting multiple codes of conduct, highlighting the use of social audits and joining various multi-stakeholder initiatives. Despite all these actions, we see workers' wages continue to be driven down, horrific working conditions, brands cutting and running to find cheaper labour, and last year we saw brands cancel billions worth of orders with suppliers and abandon their garment workers. Today, why don't we want to deep dive into why these initiatives and programmes are ineffective and what we need to do in the future to truly hold brands accountable. We are joined by brilliant speakers from around the world who will help us investigate this based on their own extensive experience and knowledge in the field. Not only we will evaluate the current context, but we will address alternatives to the current systems we have. We will then have time at the end for your questions, so get them through via the comment section. We will gain insight from Zara Khan from Home Based Women Workers Federation, Amelia Evans of MSI Integrity, Professor Azizul Islam from the University of Aberdeen, Sarah Newell from WSR Network, and Motsaya Siani from, of Workers Rights Watch, Lesotho. First, we'll begin with Zahra Khan. Zahra is the General Secretary of the Home Based Women Workers Federation, the first ever trade union of home based workers in Pakistan. She also has a Master's in Women's Studies and conducted her thesis on home based women. She and the Federation have fought since 2009 for its members to be able to claim social be security benefit and a living wage. In 2018, Sindh passed the Home Based Workers Act, making Pakistan the only country in the South Asia where home based workers are recognized as official laborers. In her own words, it was quoted in an article last year when scattered workers, especially women, organize themselves, they can move mountains and fight capitalist greed, which is one of my favorite quotes ever. So thank you so much, Zahra, for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for everyone for inviting me, basically. Uh, so uh, before starting to talk on the COVID situation and how workers face, uh, face things in, during COVID, uh, I want to uh, give you a short description in, which, in what scenario we are working in Pakistan. The population of the uh, country is uh, uh, 212 million, according to the 2018 statistics. The total workforce of Pakistan is 68 million, uh, out of which only 1% workers are uh, the organized union. Uh, and textile is the largest manufacturing industry in Pakistan and in Asia. 
Pakistan is the eighth largest exporter of uh, textile products. From uh, from its 20 to 20 billion foreign exchange earned from this sector and other is form of remedies, remittance, Pakistan earned 22 million. And even this sector uh, generate more, uh, more this, you can say this 5% employment for skilled and unskilled labor, or you can say that 70% worker are engaged with this sector from field to uh, value added product and 70% uh, Pakistan economy is dominated by the informal uh, sector. Regarding working condition, uh, factory workers are not formal workers. Very few workers are the formal workers, and because they don't have, uh, because like 95% workers are the, uh, we can say that the work on the contract basis, they don't have the appointment letter, which shows the real status of the relationship uh, between the uh, with the factory owner. Majority of the worker work under the third party contract system. They are not even registered with the social security schemes. Only uh, four to five percent workers are registered with the health uh, health uh, benefit schemes and the uh, pension scheme. Working hour is normally is twelve to fourteen hours in Pakistan, uh, including um, overtime, and they got very low wages. Even not received the minimum wage, uh, what we have at the province level. Uh, in spite of that, Pakistan has ratified 65, 60, 36 um, ILO conventions, and in 2014, Pakistan got the DSP. Um, just checking, uh, Zaha, we can't hear you at the moment. Oh, it's just me. Um, I just wait a couple of minutes. Hello. Oh, okay. You're coming back. Um, it's still a bit um robotic. There is a load shading. Sorry for that. No, don't apologize. Don't apologize. It's fine. Hello. 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 Oh, that sounds much better. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Okay. So should I speak or? Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Continue. It sounds perfect. Okay. Am I audible now? Yeah. Hello. Hello, okay, we can I hear you. Think, uh, uh, because uh, I have the load shading. Um, it's gone again. Maybe we could. Maybe we've got someone else, and then once Sarah's connection has gone better, we can continue. So, oh, is it done? Yeah. Okay. So we can go with Amelia Evans. Um, so Amelia is an international human rights lawyer and expert on business and human rights. She's an executive. Executive Director of the Institute for Multi-Stakeholder Initiative Integrity and is spearheading to the organization's transition to focus on challenging the corporate form, proposing and advancing business models that are owned and governed by workers and communities. Previously, she was the Global Human Rights Fellow at Harvard Law School and a clinical supervisor at Harvard Law School's International Human Rights Clinic. She's also currently an Open Society Fellow on Economic Inequality. Wonderful, thank you so much. And here's hoping we can get Zara back to continue, um, continue what she was just starting to so, 
uh, tragically kind of lay out about inequities in Bangladesh for home workers. So um, my background is really coming at looking at all of these different voluntary systems that are set up to um, address labor and other types of abuses um, and to understand, you know, are they working? Um, and our organization for the last decade has really been focused in on that question. We were, as I think was hinted at in that bio, um, originally founded at Harvard Law School's International Human Rights Clinic. And so we kind of have brought with us a kind of research like methodology to just saying, look, there have been so many of these different types of initiatives that have been sort of established in an effort to try to get companies to address human rights abuses and are they working? And our organization in particular has focused on a type of initiative that brings in different stakeholders, which are often seen as a sort of, for a long time was seen as the sort of gold standard in the business and human rights space, because the initiatives are not just being governed and set up by companies and industry, but in fact often have civil society sort of sitting and working alongside with them. And effectively, after a decade of deep research into the space, what we found is that these uh, initiatives are not fit for purpose. They are not functioning in a way that can ensure the respect rights for workers, and that leads to really meaningful, tangible change. And so I just wanted to sort of outline for all of you a kind of systematic way of looking at these different initiatives and why it is, which for me leads me to answer the question posed by this in terms of uh, have these accreditation uh, you know, schemes and logos failed workers as absolutely they have failed workers. And I would say a step further, they failed all of us, putting us into a space of sort of believing that there has been meaningful progress made and diverting our attention from more meaningful solutions. So, you know, I think the first thing to ask is like, what are a lot of these initiatives actually asking? What, what sort of changes are they asking to have happen? So what are they sort of demanding of those who participate in them? And the first thing to note around that is that particularly with those that are dealing with complex supply chains, what they're really asking for is for those actors at the bottom of the supply chain, the people who are producing materials to change their behavior. They are not, for the most part, actually asking brands who have a lot more economic power and a lot more money to spend to change their behavior. The point I'm going to kind of keep coming back to if we're thinking about how do we address abuse and where should we be focusing our attention. So the way that these initiatives tend to uh, like behave and set, set up is to say, if you want to get accredited, then the supplier now needs to change its behavior by meeting, meeting certain sort of standards that are going to be set up by this initiative or regime. And, you know, if you look at a lot of these initiatives, we've got 40 that we track in our database. Three quarters of them use the term sustainable, fair, equitable, or responsible in their title. But when you really dig in to understanding what actual standards or obligations are being asked of a lot of those sort of factories or farms, the reality is a lot of things that you would think might be in the mix are not there. For example, this question of are workers being paid a living wage? Are they actually being like required, are, are fact, farms and factories and other producers requiring that their workers are being, being asked to, to ensure that their workers receive enough money to put food on the table, to cover basic housing um, and cost of living? And when you look at these initiatives, all of the prominent ones that we really looked at in any detail, you only saw one initiative that had any obligation that was time bound to say workers need to receive a living wage. And so you can be buying these products with these labels on them that say this is fair and sustainable, but in fact, workers aren't even being asked or in, in any way guaranteed that they're gonna get a living wage. So that's like this fundamental thing. Secondly, as I said before, all of the obligations being put on suppliers is actually risking contributing to harm rather than thinking about actually like, how can we shift change? So what do I mean by that? Well, when you, when you buy a product, the way that you're buying it is that a brand, the final person who's putting it on the table for you, is often essentially had to contract down its supply chain, right? And throughout that supply chain has had terms and conditions put on suppliers. And so the question is, what are the terms and conditions that they're putting on suppliers? How much are they going to pay for products? How quickly do they ask to get to, to turn those products around? Um, and those terms and conditions, as you can imagine, really affect the conditions of workers on the because if it is being asked to do, turn a product around very quickly uh, with very minimal profit, perhaps even required in certain circumstances to pay 
debts um, to pay less than cost because they need to re retain the relationship with that brand at a certain moment. What does that do? Uh, pressure on the supplier um, who's often operating in single digit sort of profit margins, and that has been found to be, to be the case in Rana Plaza. Um, then pressure on those suppliers to cut corners. And where do they cut corners? They cut corners on safety and labor costs for the most part. And so what you see is that the way in which these systems are sort of being set up by putting more and more pressure on the supplier, rather than thinking about the responsibility of the brand to pay a fair amount, uh, to sort of order thoughtfully and responsibly, it's really putting a lot more pressure in the very place that we're trying to alleviate that, um, that harm and responsibility. So, you know, who's being asked to change and what's being asked to change? Like the summary there is like, we don't, it varies from initiative to initiative, but in, in some, it's often very disappointing, the actual change that's being asked and that change is being placed on suppliers rather than brands for the most part. So the next sort of question is like, well, how do we know whether those changes are actually being implemented? How do we know whether even with that sort of more limited framework, suppliers are actually meeting um, their obligations. And the way that most of these initiatives are structured is that they use a system called social auditing, which is that a third party goes in and gets a sense of what's happening uh, in the labor conditions in the particular uh, factory or farm um, of production. And what we've started to see time and time again is this huge body of research that these audits simply do not work. And I think we're gonna hear about this from many of the other speakers, but all you need to do is sort of cast your mind to the experience of what it would be like. Um, and this is what we've heard ourselves as sort of spending time um, with workers in the Philippines and Cameroon. This is their experience of a social audit. Is that management, the people who are exploiting you or treating you poorly or where you're at risk of such things, announce to you that someone is going to come in uh, and then or inspect the farm and inspect working conditions. They have control over when that occurs, what workers will be working that day, whether and who um, there'll be a kind of conversation with sort of auditors. So there's a, this is coming in who's actually in cahoots with a lot of a perspective and understanding this is not an independent party. Um, this is someone who's got a relationship to management. Whether that's true or not, uh, that's how it's often perceived. Then there's very little assurance given about whether there'll be any, if they speak tr truthfully and freely about what's really going on, will they be free of any reprisal? Will they potentially risk losing their job? Other people losing their job? In certain contexts, there can be you know, cases of sort of physical retaliation. Very little assurance, if any, tends to be given. And so it's unsurprising that we see and read in the newspapers time and time again that these audits are consistently failing, that you'll have a factory or farm that's certified uh, only to find some tragedy occurs later on. And that's a systematic problem. So the next question is, well, what happens if there are abuses that do turn up, say, even in all of this limited set of standards and obligations, are they actually detected? Well, when abuses occur, there's still another like systematic flaw, which is that uh, often within these spaces, there's a lot of discretion, there's an ability to, to appeal. Um, there's then often this can go up to a large kind of stakeholder body to determine whether or not um, the supplier should be deterred, should be you know, kicked out of the system or not. But fundamentally what occurs at best is that the factory or supplier loses their accreditation. What doesn't happen is any attention on the brand itself or any examination of how systematically they might be sourcing from these unaccredited suppliers. So there's a lot I could keep going on about sort of like looking at all of these systematic flaws, but just to sort of, I guess, wrap up, I wanted to say, look, one of the, the major things that sort of underlie why these systems are, are not working is that they're voluntary and they've been primarily sort of governed and set up by industry and sometimes with civil society, but very rarely with workers themselves having power. And I feel they've done a fantastic job in sort of distracting us from what would be more powerful, which are like really strong binding obligations, whether that's through some voluntary, so through, whether it's through industry-based initiatives, which we're gonna hear from and, and others on this panel, or whether it's from just like demanding this through different types of law at local, national and international levels. The other thing that's distracted us from, big picture, is our conception of what makes for an ethical company. 
And I think we've been tricked into saying an ethical company is one that sort of sources responsibly, rather than starting to say, actually, is it an ethical company, one in which workers themselves are sharing in the profit and the value that's being sort of created? Is it an ethical company, one in which workers have decision-making power? And so my sort of sort of encouragement is for us to try to like, get ourselves out of the blind uh, that we've been put under and try to think about how we can move forward in these ways. So thank you all, looking forward to this. No, thank you so much. And that last point about, I guess, the co-option of the term ethical, I think it's so prominent. And I think if we can kind of mold that into something else, because I think it's been such an ambiguous term that brands can easily just throw back here and there. And so everything you've said is so just, I'm just like, yes. Um, I think, um, let's try it. Zephyr, are you okay? Would you like to try again? Can you hear? No. <clears throat> can you hear us? Uh, hello, yes. Hi, uh, do you want to, let's see how it goes. I think you sound, you sound um, more clearer. More clear? So I, yeah. I think I should have to start directly now. <laughs> Otherwise, I had get another connection issue then. Um, as you all know, uh, that the coronavirus has not only killing human beings, but also increasing economic uh, miseries of poor masses all over the world. Uh, Pakistan also hit by the COVID-19 in multiple dimensions, including unbearable economic condition and during lockdown. Um, in last year, in 2020, uh, the government uh, also gave this data that uh, 12 to 18 million workers had lost their jobs. And according to the CCC report, uh, only 2.2 2 million workers are from the textile and garment sector. So uh, this lead to the increased object poverty. And due to the IMF-driven policies, uh, inflation rate is rapidly increasing in Pakistan. Prices of all the essential items is growing, uh, growing day by day and working. Workers don't have money to pay utility bills, house rent, their children's school fee, even buying essential food items or pay uh, for their medical uh, medical treatment. And it, it has had a huge impact on the informal workers, especially the daily wage workers or the and the home-based workers who come at the end of the supply chain. And uh, their real employers are not even visible. So... Um, the brand are least concerned about the exploitation in the whole supply chain or even think about the home-based workers. So there is no any law, I think, at international level who talk about the home-based worker in the supply chain or have any any kind of uh, uh, program for this. So now we are discussing on with like industry or in CCC that you have to include the home-based workers as well in the uh, GFA and other, other kind of uh, things were uh, already had uh, a bad due to the implementation of IMF agenda, but now it's worsening because of the COVID. Still, the situation is not very good. Uh, previously, market were completely closed, which affected the office workers, and now again, government is imposing the lockdown to the increased cases of the coronavirus, second wave coming in Pakistan. Still, workers don't have the regular and, uh, and the proper work, despite of that, this is the, the season of work and selling of as well. Or I can say that the local market take its whole year consumption during this month. Um, last time, home-based workers didn't get paid for their complete work and still they are getting their payment in installment. Right now, they work in very low wages without any benefit. They used to earn less. Um, and, now, and now they even don't have that income anymore. There, there were many uh, things which was in pipeline, like to set the home based workers pages, to set the home based workers pages, and start home based workers with the social security net, working on their wages dispute or the registration of the home based worker with the labor department. All this was to, to be discussed, but due to the decided, but due to the uh, COVID, the whole process was stopped and delayed. And even when we have started, Working on this from last November or uh, September, we got news that another lockdown is going on. So there are many tools um, uh, through which workers, working and living condition of workers might be improved, which include the ILO Convention, national law, uh, national laws, GSP plus instrument, and now recent team. Uh, Hello. Oh, hello. Hi, Vicky. Okay. 
so but uh, but at the moment all these um, unfortunately fail to make any positive impact on the living and working condition of the workers like um, agreement uh, which are talk uh, be before me i think so i don't know her name she is speaking that uh, the that we should have to go for the voluntary agreement but i think agreement which brand should be binding other the agreements all the agreements uh, with brand should be binding otherwise they never fulfill their commitment which we saw clearly during the lockdown voluntary agreement failed to protect workers right we can take example of gfa which can can't uh, show good results especially in pakistan context and I give you the example of hnm factories Uh, in pak in karachi especially especially they are polluting severely they are polluting the workers right they exploiting the workers from their jobs even they are not paying their dues even women workers are facing harassment recently to uh, three day, days before uh, one factory it's a um, uh, denim clothing factory which also produce for the hnm some women uh, who demanded uh, the advance money for because uh, in pakistan after fasting we have the eid festival mm -hmm. so everyone is celebrating this festive so that's why they were demanding the bonus and the advance money uh, advance salary but uh, they the women and the men were um, harassed by the gangsters who work in the uh, factory and the factory didn't take any action against those workers who who beat in the workers or even the women as well so this is the bad example recently we got from uh, the one factory which is signed by the gf or included you can say the in gfa so voluntary agreement is not working properly and bangladesh we have the good example of the bangladesh accord uh, which played very significant role in uh, a role to improve the osh condition at the factory level and it's improving mechanism was uh, monitoring sorry especially the monitoring mechanism was very effective but unfortunately this agreement is going to be end in may 2001 uh, 21 uh, workers bodies in pakistan had started initiative with the support of clean cloth campaign and industrial to extend the bangladesh accord to, to pakistan but it's um, uh, very depressing to see that the brand aren't ready to extend even even in the bangladesh accord so this is this is the this is the situation which we are facing here uh, in and in a covid 19 brand miserably failed to protect workers living a livelihood and uh, didn't show any concrete program to um, compensate worker in their supply chain we have witnessed um, worse tragedy of the ali enterprise factory fire and a uh, uh, and a german brand which got its supplies uh, from that factory had not accepted the responsibility of that mishap uh i think you know about the ali enterprise factory fire in 2012 uh, in which uh, 260 259 workers were burned alive so there was no law in germany to make uh, the brand accountable in court of law in germany so victim of ali enterprises were lost their uh, their case in um, a german court because of no law it's good sign that now legislation is in uh, in its final stage to make brand and uh, company accountable in germany for their crime and misdeed uh, committed uh, anywhere at out of the germany i think we need that kind of binding and mandatory legislation uh, treaties or agreement to protect workers side right? and along um, with a strong but easy or um, uh, approachable monitoring system with workers representative in it Thank you. And so the most important, sorry. and sorry. the most important thing which we are now uh, discussing after the COVID, we are discussing uh, the need of for one thing, which is so important and now being acknowledged by everyone at country level and as well as the nationally, that all workers must be registered in the social security. Therefore, uh, there are, therefore, the demand for the utilization of social security is our top priority. So everyone. everyone can be protected through this thank you so much um if you don't we've sent all the links to zahra's um work and her twitter account but i i implore you to please follow her work and the work of the home base 
in Workers' Federation because they, they do so much. And especially what I didn't know much about home-based workers until I saw Zephyr's work. And um, everything she said and everything she's pushing for is just so inspiring. So thank you so much, Zephyr. And I'm so sorry for the connection issues. Thank you so much for being patient with us. Um, next, we have uh, Professor Aziz Islam. So Aziz is a leading sustainability accounting researcher investigating some of the specific issues, including human rights disclosures, corporate transparency and modern slavery, SDGs, social audit and corporate anti-bribery measures. Over the past 16 years, Aziz has been investigating the use of social audits and CSR disclosures in relation to the lives of those who work in garment factories in Bangladesh that supply goods to big multinational corporations based in North America, Europe and Australia. His research collaborations are currently underway with international institutions and researchers based in Australia, Bangladesh, Canada, Egypt, New Zealand, Nigeria, Portugal, and the USA. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Maisha, uh, for introducing me. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I'm delighted to present uh, today. Uh, uh, today, my focus is social audits. So as you see, the Emilia already presented, uh, you know, a few aspects of social audits. So I would like to highlight uh, today how social audits um, play a role in changing uh, forced labor conditions. So my focus is forced labor today. Uh, over the 16 years, uh, I have investigated corporate accountability and transparency in relation to the lives of, the ch of those who work in garment factories um, for global retailers. So I have particularly investigated um, transparency mechanism uh, such as social audits uh, and corporate responsibility disclosures about factory working conditions within the global supply chain. So my research in line with what, what Emilia actually found uh, from her long uh, years of study, uh, despite social audits that multinational retailers use, workers' economic and human rights have not improved. While retailers' revenues balloon and factory owners get rich. So today I would like to take uh, um, I would like to highlight two particular uh, uh, disasters so, so that I can explain my uh, the notion of social audits oil. So I've taken a closer look at uh, the role social audits played before and after uh, the Azrin incidents uh, that killed 112 workers uh, in 2012, it is in Bangladesh. And then also Rana Plaza that killed, as you know, that killed um, uh, more than 1,100 workers and injuring many workers. So it was in, uh, back in uh, you know, the same week uh, in uh, 2013s. So during these two major disasters, social audits had been carried out but failed to save workers from factory collapse or, or factory fire. Just before the Tazreen fire incident, uh, US retail giant Walmart had performed an audit that flagged violations of, of its own code of conduct. Despite this, Walmart continued to source products from Tazreen un until the fire occurred. So this was reported by um, New York Times during that time. In relation to Rana Plaza incident, until Rana Plaza collapse, the structural problems, the structural problems, the factory building was less likely to be part of the social audits. And the building safety often overlooked and neglected by the auditors in the audit process. Although the retailers sourcing uh, products from factories at Rana Plaza had social audit mechanism in place, these audits did not protect the workers from a factory owner that forced them to work in an unsafe building. My research 
found that multinational retailers and the suppliers uh, often use social audits as a symbolic and ritual strategy that help maintain existing social inequalities rather than protecting the welfare of workers. As you all know, actually, up, right after Rana Plaza collapse, the global community has desperately started fixing uh, structure, structural problems, uh, building structure problems and worker safety. The two international bodies, Accord and Alliance, had been formed in collaboration with a number of multinational retailers to improve uh, safety of government workers uh, uh, government factories in Bangladesh. So these two bodies have arguably succeeded in putting in place a binding process with their building and fire inspections. But a serious problem that has remained fairly untouched, that is forced labor. So many have ignored the inconvenient truth that Forced labor was one of the real causes for deaths and injuries at Rana Plaza. The owner, factory owner forced, for, frightened workers to get into a building in which major structural cracks had already been discovered. The parties responsible for the structural problems of the building were also violators of basic human rights through forced labor. If government workers had not been forced into the building, the building would still have collapsed, but fewer workers would have lost their lives. Taking a closer look at the everyday journey of workers at both Tazreen and Rana Plaza, it is obvious that the deaths and human sufferings would have been prevented if forced labor had not been eliminated. I mean, had been eliminated. So over the past 16 years, and long before Rana Plaza incident, I have observed uh, major buyers, including H&M, um, Walmart, Marks and Spencer, uh, Jara, Primark, and many others uh, adopt a clear code of conduct and audit mechanism indicating zero tolerance of forced labor. But such codes, such audit mechanism fail to protect workers. If the forced labor condition was audited well, workers' freedom could be ensured and casualty list following man-made disasters might have been shorter. Unfortunately, uh, forced labor persists and is responsible for killing and injuring many workers in garment factories. Now I'd like to highlight about uh, the, the role of social audits during this current pandemic time. So during the pandemic time, along with disproportional layout in, on the rise, existing workers' capacity to demand fair, fair pay and advocate for human rights are significantly reduced. These are concerns that forced labor is increasing across, across the globe, like from China to Bangladesh, along with other major concerns, such as violence against women in factories in Bangladesh and its neighbor, India, factories, have been seen for, to force pregnant workers to resign. So during pandemic, many retailers have stopped carrying out social audits. Many have found the pandemic a handy excuse to avoid using social audits. Although my early research revealed that historically, uh, the way social audits were used has not helped to protect workers' rights at garment factories, the absence of an audit during the pandemic appears to have made forced labor condition worse. So absence of social audit 
does mean that forced labor, slavery, sexual abuse are not traceable at all. In a crisis, whether an accidental fire, building collapse, or a pandemic, forced labor is something that is difficult to audit. Having said that, no audit can change the situation. It is what is done with the audit result. As workers are weak and vulnerable uh, actors, uh, there's a need for a credible approach to social audits at a broader level, uh, some sort of regulatory intervention along with civil society resistance to forced labor is preferable to simply doing nothing, waiting for another disaster. So thank you, my thank you uh, 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 for listening to me. Um, that, that was uh, very insightful. And it's quite disgusting knowing that um, there's been an absence of social audits during COVID. Um, more definitely needs to be done. Um, yeah, so next we have Sarah Newell. Sarah is the Director of Outreach and Communications for the Worker Driven Social Responsibility Network. Prior to joining WSRN, Sarah was Communications and Campaign Coordinator for the International Labour Rights Forum, a human rights organisation dedicated to advancing dignity and justice for workers in the global economy. While at ILF, ILRF, they campaigned in support of a Accord on Fire and Building Safety in Bangladesh, a legally, a legally, a legally binding agreement between workers and Apple brands to make factories safe. <laughs> Sarah. Hi everyone, so wonderful to be here with you today. Um, I'm really excited to talk about some of the solutions um, and talk about ways in which workers are rebalancing the way power currently exists in the garment industry. Um, so we've heard the argument for why corporate social responsibility doesn't work uh, and hasn't borne any fruit for workers. Um, and the alternative to that is worker-driven social responsibility. And in some ways, I think it's very common sense. Um, workers are experts on their own working conditions and workers are the people who are there to spot violations and who are the best auditors of their own daily lives. Um, so of course it makes sense that programs designed by workers would be most effective for workers. So when I say a worker-driven social responsibility program, what I mean is an agreement between a global corporation and a worker organization that embodies a set of principles. I'm gonna talk through those principles quickly and then I'll talk through some examples of these programs. So the first principle is that labor rights initiatives must be worker driven, like we just talked about. The next is that obligations for global corporations must be binding and enforceable. And this is really key because we know from corporate social responsibility that we can't trust corporations to monitor their own supply chains and to you know, self-police and self-enforce uh, you know, the, the standards that they agree to. So it's critical that there be a legally binding component to any of these agreements. They sign contracts, you know, companies sign contracts with every single person in their supply chain, often except the workers who are actually sewing the clothes that they're going to sell. So it makes sense that there would be a binding contract between the worker organizations and the global corporations in order to keep everyone honest and accountable. The next principle is that buyers need to afford suppliers the financial incentive and capacity to comply. So like my colleague just talked about, suppliers are often absolutely squeezed by the downward price pressure that brands put on them by paying extremely low prices for their clothes. And they may often you know, not be able to implement these improvements even if they wanted to. You know, in the case of Bangladesh and the, uh, what the Bangladesh Accord has done for factory safety, a lot of those structural improvements that need to be made to buildings so that they're safe for workers to enter are expensive, are capital intensive, and suppliers, you know, often don't have access to that sort of money. So the buyers, the people who have the money need to be moving that money down the supply chain so that suppliers can actually implement the standards that they say that they want them to follow. Like Amelia was talking about, 
it, you know, suppliers can only do what the buyers make possible. The fourth principle is that consequences for non-compliant suppliers must be mandatory. So what this means in practice is that if, if someone assaults a worker on the line and needs, and that person, that abuser needs to be removed and the supplier says, oh, that's my brother-in-law. I, I won't be firing him. I, I know it's a violation of the code of conduct, but I'm, I'm not gonna follow through with that, even though that's what the auditing body says needs to be done. In a worker-driven social responsibility program, those suppliers would no longer be allowed to do business with the brands who were part of that program. So there's an actual financial consequence for not following through on the remediate, remediation action that they need to be taken. And the last two principles are that gains for workers must be measurable and timely, which is something that is not included in any corporate social responsibility program that I know of. Um, you know, a program isn't inherently good just because it exists. If it's not creating measurable and timely improvements in workers' lives, then it's not a useful program and those resources should be going elsewhere. And the last is that verification of workplace compliance needs to be rigorous and independent. Um, this is so critical because as we've said before, brands can't be trusted to monitor their own supply chains. And it's really important that workers receive training on how to monitor worker rights violations in their own supply chains, and then that they have an independent and trusted place to report those violations that they know is going to work with them to resolve the complaint. Um, and like my colleague is gonna talk about is happening in Lesotho, this can be a long process, building that trust between the monitoring body and the workers to create a program where workers believe that they can report a serious and sensitive violation and get the help and support that they need. You know, that takes time to develop because that's really not the way supply chains are set up right now. Um, so a program that involves all six of these principles that is set up in this way, can really make a difference and be impactful for workers. And there are four programs that are in place today that meet these standards. Two are in the United States. There's the Fair Food Program, which involves tomato farmers, tomato farm workers, and uh, flower farm workers, and some other agricultural workers, all alongside the East Coast of the United States. Um, and that program came out of a really intense human trafficking case that was happening in Florida, where farm workers got together and decided to change the balance of power and change the way things worked after this trafficking case um, and created this really successful program. The other in the United States is the Milk with Dignity program in Vermont, and that involves dairy workers who produce milk for Ben and Jerry's, everyone's favorite uh, ice cream company. Um, and then the other two are, are in apparel, the Bangladesh Accord, like of course we've talked about today. And then the last is in Lesotho. And I will pass it over to my colleague to talk more about that. The Lesotho program is, is the newest um, and I think is a really exciting moment to see how this model can be expanded. Um, before I do that, I wanna mention one more effort that is in place in the apparel industry for a, a worker-driven social responsibility program that does not yet exist, but that needs to. Um, and that's the Pay Your Workers campaign. So this is a coalition of 220 organizations worldwide that are pushing for a worker-driven social responsibility agreement globally with garment brands that would obligate brands to make sure workers are paid their full wages for the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic, to pay into a severance guarantee fund so that workers are paid the severance that they're legally owed when their factories close or shut down, um, and also, uh, it forces companies to respect labor rights and freedom of association so that workers can continue to organize without retaliation and repression. I think this is a really important effort that's being led by a multitude of worker unions in garment producing countries all around the world. Folks who are interested can find more information at payyourworkers.org. Um, and there's plenty of ways for consumers to get involved that you can find on the website. Thanks. Thank you so much. Like, I think I'm already feeling a bit more hopeful just hearing about those examples and the fact that there is so much work being done to provide an alternative to what we just heard. But now I'm super excited to introduce uh, Motsuwa Sinyani, who um, has worked most of her life with civil society organizations in Lesotho. She has head, headed a number of Lesotho-based non-governmental organizations, including being the president of the Lesotho Council of NGOs, she is currently the president of the board of the Transformation Resource Center, where she worked as the director. 
uh, Transmate Resource Center is a peace, justice, and participatory democracy organization. In 2006, she was also the founding director of the Blue Cross Southern Africa Regional Resource Center, an organization dealing with weaning addicts against drugs and alcohol. Before joining the Workers' Rights Watch, she was the director of care for Bazuku Association, a local organization that deals with environmental protection and integrated catchment management systems. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me um, to be part of uh, this exercise. <laughs> I'm going to speak about uh, the work of uh, Workers' Rights Watch. Uh, which uh, Sarah has already alluded to very briefly. Uh, we um, um, you know, a non-governmental organization, Workers' Rights Watch, uh, with uh, the mandate to uh, receive cases of uh, gender-based violence from workers, uh, to investigate such cases, and to issue out determinations uh, based on the outcome of the investigations. And uh, this organization has um, about five partners who came together to found it. Uh, three trade and local trade unions, uh, two women's organizations, uh, local women also organizations, and uh, two international worker rights organizations, a Solidarity Center and Workers' Rights Consortium. And uh, we have a binding agreement uh, with uh, the, between the organizations as well as uh, the brands uh, with Nanjing, um the factory owner as a signatory to that agreement. So it has all uh, the important components uh, being a signatory to that uh, agreement, which also goes together with uh, a code of conduct. Um, I'm just going quickly over. Um, and uh, the <clears throat> local partners, as well as uh, the international partners, meet on a weekly basis just to touch base and make sure that each and every component of uh, the program runs uh, well. Uh, where there are some issues, then they are tended to find a way to go forward with it. Uh, the three components of uh, the program um, the education and awareness program where workers are trained on, on knowing your rights. Um, then there's a, an information line, um, sort of like a hotline uh, where workers report cases of uh, gender-based violence nature. And then there's uh, the third component, which is um, the investigation and determination component where it is done by, by Workers' Rights Watch itself. Um, the information line component is dealt with by one of uh, the women's organizations and the education and awareness is done mostly, the trainers are coming from the trade union movement. Um, so as we are implementing uh, this agreement and the code of conduct, uh, I'm just going to cover up some of uh, the observations that I've made so far on, on how well this works uh, or maybe doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> starting with uh, the workers, uh, what I've observed is that um, workers, this is a new thing and workers are still trying to figure out whether um, can we trust this animal called Workers' Rights Watch uh, for so many um, decades, so long, uh, gender issues of gender-based violence have just continued unabated. And suddenly when there's a new program that they are supposed to trust, uh, perhaps the trust will not come so fast. Um, then secondly, I've also observed that because of uh, the current uh, issues of uh, COVID-19, there have been a lot of uh, layoffs and that also affects the psyche of workers that if I have this job and now I report a case of GBVH, my, they, maybe it might actually jeopardize 
my position at work. So given the fact that most of uh, these men and women really are dependent on these jobs um, for their day-to-day -day lives, it is extremely important for them that they would rather stay with the job, even if there's harassment going on, than report. Um, you know, they look at the larger picture that, you know, I wouldn't uh, allow my family to starve just because I, I wanted to report. So, so, so those are some of the things. And um, looking at, you know, the three signatories, uh, well, sort of like the five signatories, I think also that has been, because it's a new um, idea, a new uh, way of working, it is needing um, time and again for for the parties to meet and uh, in the meetings it's not always so easy to kind of like see things from the same point of view um, there will always be differing opinions which is uh, fine so um, it needs a lot of uh, patience and, and time to consult with each other and I like that model because at each and every aspect, uh, there is no time that any one of uh, the partners in, is not involved in, in everything that we do. We try to make sure that everyone is uh, involved and we are all in the know about what is happening at every uh, point. Um, um, <clears throat> the, with uh, the trade unions, um, Another observation that we have made is that um, the, in Lesotho there are more than the three trade unions which are the signatory to the agreement. So in the past, it used to be that um, the, some of the workers assumed that the program was only meant for members of uh, the three trade unions who are party uh, to, the, to the signing of uh, the agreement. But now with uh, training, they have come to realize that the program is meant for each and every person who is working um, at the machine factories. Um, and also in terms of working together with uh, Nenshing uh, as a factory owner has been okay, but uh, has also had its own challenges. Um, they have, had a, a situation where they have a, a, a direct or full um, hold on, on everything, but now they have to almost uh, share that power with another entity which is outside of their control, uh, where workers are, are you know, uh, reporting cases and determinations come to Nenshin. Uh, which they have to effect and put into place. And that has um, sometimes been kind of difficult. However, we have always uh, in the end managed to work together and make sure that uh, we revoke, invoke uh, the, the clauses of uh, the agreement to say, remember, this is binding. Uh, you cannot come out of it. Uh, this is what it is. So, but in a, in a way also that has allowed us to now have to face each other and sit down and talk about uh, things, talk about the welfare of uh, the workers. So that really has, uh, has been helpful. And I hope that going forward, uh, things will improve even more. Yeah, I think I will end that, uh, that uh, point. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I think it's really good to have the balance of knowing progress as well as what can be worked on because then we understand where we can actually improve generally across the board with binding agreements. So thank you for providing both alternatives. Um, yeah, we're now going to go to questions from the viewers. So um, now, did you find it? Were there any? If not, I have like those questions on my side. <laughs> Um, so, what is the biggest obstacle stopping us from getting more legally binding agreements put into place? Yeah, if anyone wants to answer that straight away, that's fine. 
I'm sure all my colleagues have thoughts on this, but I can just offer a few. I think one of the biggest challenges is that they're time consuming, they're time intensive. Um, you know, companies don't want to join these programs because unlike corporate social responsibility programs, it's not just a public relations boost. It requires real work and commitment and time and money. Um, so a lot of times these start with campaigns to bring companies to the table to make it more costly for them to ignore what workers are dealing with than to enter into a negotiation and, and create an agreement with them. I think um, for me, um, I would like to say uh, that what uh, Jara mentioned, Jara from Pakistan, she mentioned about one thing like the regulation, you know, should be, should be based in you know, retailers country. So if, you know, Germany, UK or USA have a strict regulation, you know, how to behave when they source product from other countries particularly in you know, the developing nations. So, I mean, uh, the, the many, of, many problems could be, you know, could be minimized. Mm. Um, uh, th th this is already happening. I mean, like, if, you, if, you, if you see UK Modern Slavery Act or, you know, USA California Transparency and Supply Chain Act. So uh, much part of this content, the acts content is largely voluntary, I would say, you know, so, there's a scope, you know, uh, to have mandatory auditing, for example, mandatory third party auditing. Perhaps, you know, what Sarah mentioned, workers driven auditing could be fascinating uh, to create change. Uh, and coming from Bangladesh, I would like to say the political change system. So if the how Western countries behave with other countries, you know, is disproportional. If you if you behave the same human rights violation, if you behave with, with one country, so you should behave with other country, you know, same way. Okay. Now, if there is some problem in Bangladesh and political condition is, is you know, the human rights violation occurring and China probably human rights violation is occurring. So the response to this two human rights violation should be proportional, but this is not this is not not the ideal society. This is a problem because bigger problem is you know the the bigger multinational company behind this, you know large group of consumers behind this, and then most importantly global politics. It is it is a complex phenomena. I mean, uh, I would say until and unless we 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 are sitting in the West. If you if you do not behave ethically, if you do not behave, you know, uh, in the way we should behave, then how could we expect they, they would create change? Bangladesh is a problem. I grew in Bangladesh, I surrounded the, the country, you know, and I grew up in Dhaka city and in an urban area surrounded by factories. I saw the lives of the workers. Workers are innocent. Mm. Yeah, um, uh, I read your recent, you spoke a lot about moral power. Yeah. Would you like to summarize that in a sentence or so, like what moral power is? Yes, this is a good question. I mean, um, this is part of my research and I looked at going back to, uh, you know, the philosophical understanding of moral standing, the moral behavior. The moral behavior is, um, the, much of the research, if you look at, you know, the mainstream business research, they try to link the morality and financial profits. They try to link actually, you know, if we do behave morally, you will earn more profits. Okay, what happens if we do not earn profit, then this notion is broken. So you cannot, so can you say, if you do not earn profit, you are not supposed to maintain human rights. This notion is broken. So I would say the new liberal notion, the, the, the way Harvard University and others are selling main business schools, that if you do social responsibilities, you'll earn more profit. That is, if you follow this notion, that is actually morally collapse notion because this does not work when you know workers' rights is broken and you you are not 
able to earn more profit. Does this mean that you are not supposed to follow particular human rights? This trade-off should be broken. If anybody else who wants to come in on that question, or we can move on. Okay. I think on the question, oh, can I just say on the question of morality, I, I, which I think is such an important one, um, I think like a couple of things that spring to mind. Like one, I think like all of us as consumers have a role to play in this in terms of like, we have just become so acclimated um, in the West to be able to buying products very cheaply and like really recognizing what is the true cost of production of something I think is incredibly important and reorienting our relationship to consumerism. I know we've all heard it a million times before, but that's one of the root drivers of this is just excessive consumption at really, really low prices. And so we all have to also recognize we have some moral complicity in, in part of this too. Um, all of us, there's no way out of that really as long as you're alive these days. It's really difficult. So like trying to think about how you can kind of change your behavior in that way, I think is a part of the moral question. And the other question I, 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 around profit, I think is so important too. I mean, I would just say the question we're not yet asking societally is, is profit moral? And I, I think we've been assuming that profit is amoral. Like it's absolutely fine to in profit and profit and profit. And that's a, that's a sign of a healthy, successful company. And I, I actually think that we need to start reorienting the way that we're thinking to say like, where is profit coming from? From who and, to, and where does it go? And to just like recognize that behind the idea of profit is often an extraction from the value produced by workers, from the work that communities are doing and, and going over to shareholders. And so it's really like reorienting the way we think about those two things. Um, so the next question really wanted to ask was, what does the panel think is the best way the public can engage with these issues? Obviously, you've spoken about the problematic nature of some accreditations and the use of kind of ethical terms when that doesn't necessarily apply in a strict sense. And I think that can lead often people and, and consumers, as we're talking about it, um, feel quite powerless about how they can actually engage on the, these issues. Um, so is that through lobbying the brands? Is it through lobbying politicians to actually pass laws? For example, in the UK where we're based. Um, I don't know. I think uh, the, the issue here in my research, I found that, you know, I looked at the social movements and NGOs responsibility, you know, so how they move over over two decades, you know, so what the role in creating change. So I found that consumers are not the center of change so far. Consumers' behavior, you know, needs to be changed substantially. So if they behave socially responsibly, responsibly then there will be a change, a real change. But if see the two, 20, 2002 and 2008, now, you know, 2012, Four, thirteen, one after another incident occurring, happening, a, a disaster happening in Rana Plaza, you know, back in 2030. What happened? Consumer did not reduce the demand uh, from the same, you know, retailer. It's still going to the same retailer and, and buying their products. So that means consumers, you know, are not, you know, uh, well aware about uh, the social responsibility, you know, so this is a big problem, but anything change, what I saw actually including the regulation, regulatory change in the UK. So it is the contribution of social movement organization. Those who are, those who are working, you know, those who are fighting for, you know, the, the maybe, you know, maybe consumer as a group, consumer group or NGOs, worker rights organization in the UK. So they are really, really strong to create change. So I find change is there, but consumers, uh, so far, you know, so need a, need a big awareness mm, and, and maybe, you know, so educate consumers is important thing here. Anybody, anybody else want to come in on that? Sure. Uh, I think I, I would add that, you know, 
well, I'll, I'll start by saying I, most of the consumers I work with are in the United States. Um, so that's my caveat, but there seems, at least when I talk to most folks, there's a very individualistic uh, idea behind it. Like what can I do with my individual dollar and individual shopping practices that will improve things for garment workers? And I think as Aziz just said, there, there really isn't. Consumers are not the driver of change in that way, unless consumers are, it's, you know, instructed by workers to boycott a certain company at a certain time in a certain way. And they do that in a large group. So if I'm going to buy from a new brand I've never bought from before, I'll Google the name, look it up. Is there a campaign against this? Are, you know, are there workers anywhere in the supply chain that are calling for specific consumer action? If there isn't, then, you know, I think the general guidelines Amelia gave being conscious of consumption, consuming less, buying less whenever possible, or buying used whenever possible. Um, but for the most part, you know, consumers should put their actions towards joint efforts that are being called for by workers, which is why I always give the pay your workers campaign as an example, because that is what garment workers are calling for. And if garment workers are calling for it, that is a safe bet that it is what garment workers want. And that's where you should put your time and energy. Um, and so people can get you know, can do more by focusing on this collective efforts than their individual shopping practices. Well, thank See if anybody else wants to come in on that. And if not, we'll move on to another question. Okay. Okay, we'll move on there. Um, I think we've got one uh, specifically here um, in relation to um, what difficulties have been faced on, on the ground for workers um, and maybe specifically in relation to the situation um, in Lesotho um, and, and you know, the challenges that workers face when the worker-driven social responsibility is set up. Sorry, Gareth, I, I couldn't quite catch you. Oh, okay. Well, I will. Uh, what I can do is I can put the question in the chat box to you if Thank you want. You. There. Thank you. Does anybody else want to come in on that at the moment? And I'll just type that up. Okay. Thanks for bearing with me there. Have you got the question there? Okay. Um, well, the situation in Lesotho in the past has not always been uh, welcome, especially by government. Uh, whenever sort of workers try to implement uh, social responsibility initiatives, uh, they have always been silenced by uh, whatever government in power using the police and uh, the yeah, so security system. So that has not been a healthy uh, environment, unfortunately. Does anybody else want to come in on that question? Okay, we'll just move on then to another question we've had um, sent in. Um, when funds are talking about new agreements they've signed, are there any are there any red flags that you suggest that the public kind of look for in, in them that you have experience from agreements in the past that kind of haven't led up to their standards? Uh, 
I missed the beginning part. I'm sorry. Was that for me? Sorry, no, it was just a, just a question in general we've had come in. And it was really around when brands are announcing new um, kind of uh, social responsibility initiatives or agreements that they've signed up to. Are there any clear sort of red flags or signs or warnings people should look for to indicate that, you know, this might not be a one that really delivers what it's telling the public that it's there for? Since I'm already off mute, I will answer. I think it's an easy one. If the brand is announcing it and not the worker organization, that's a red flag. And my first question when I see a brand do that is I, I want to write to them and say, what is the counterpart worker organization that's leading this? How can I get in touch with them? I would love to hear their thoughts on the program, whether it's a union, a worker center, who is the group representing workers in your supply chain who have said, this is a good idea. This is what workers want. And it's, it's, you're not going to find it. There's not going to be a good answer to that. But I encourage people to ask brands that question um, if they see a brand announcement. Anybody else? Yeah, I think now you've got a question come in, haven't you? This is for Amelia. Um, in the report for Not Fit for Purpose um, that went over 10 years, was there a common thread among the MSIs and um, that were investigated in terms of failures or were the reasons for the failure to protect the workers varied? Great question. Yeah, for us, we were really pointing to kind of six main like trends that we saw across um, these initiatives. I kind of pointed to a number of them when I spoke, but basically, you know, some of the key ones were setting standards um, that don't fail, that fail to kind of address the root causes of abuse. And in fact, that might create misperceptions that, you know, uh, issues are being addressed when they're not. Um, another one was that uh, MSIs actually, a lot of these initiatives, they actually risk embedding a power imbalance between civil society and workers and uh, corporations themselves, both in the way that they're governed, um, but then in the ways in which they kind of play out. Then the others were around, you know, the failure to reliably detect abuses um, and hold companies to account when those abuses are found. A big one, which we haven't talked about here, but uh, really a, a lack of, of a lot of these initiatives to provide access to remedy, to any kind of, um, you know, remediation when abuse occurs to workers and communities. I mean, we of the 40 we looked at, uh, a third of MSIs didn't have any mechanism or complaints mechanism at all where you could even file a report. And then of the two thirds that have one, they don't meet even the most basic um, accepted kind of good practices for complaints mechanisms. That is, they're often highly inaccessible. They might be buried somewhere on an MSI's website, but how on earth is a worker um, supposed to know on the ground in a factory that A, this initiative even exists, B, that it has a website, C, that they're entitled to particular protections around it, and then D, that there's a complaints mechanism buried somewhere on a, on a website, for example. And then the last one, like really fundamental, was that, you know, this is not evidence of impact. That when you look at, there's been so many studies done on specific initiatives and really, like, really start to analyze what's here, um, you just see time and time again major questions coming up uh, across all the different researchers um, you know really at this point hundreds of different studies that are just saying show us the impact on the ground show us that the meaningful benefits and there's just as many questions um, there as, as, as sort of at the beginning and all of that for us pointed to the conclusion that really these initiatives in terms of cross-cutting problems they were not fundamentally challenging corporate power by remaining voluntary and giving corporations the decision-making power, all of these sort of points, they didn't shift power away from corporations in the way that it has to happen if we're going to address sort of, you know, human rights abuses. And that power, of course, as we're hearing, needs to shift towards workers and towards communities. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've had another question come in here. Um, it, it talks about somebody recalling seeing the union made logo on products in the past and wondering whether the panel thinks that's a useful approach in terms of communicating the fact that obviously organised, recognised trade union have been involved in the production of the product.
Anybody want to come in on that? Some thoughts on that. I think, um, you know, the union made label was effective at the time because it was differentiating between two things, union and non-union. Those were the two types of clothes. They wanted people to buy one and not the other. Because of globalization and the way the apparel supply chain is built now, I don't think that there is an equivalent label that could encompass things. You know, things are no longer, things are not green or red, right? It's either good or it's bad. There are many shades of gray. And I think all labeling systems sort of miss that point and necessarily obscure things. Um, what's important is that it's a program that's working for workers, not the certification and marketing piece of that. Um, that said, you know, I am all for thinking of creative ideas to uh, help folks recognize when there has been worker leadership, whether it's in the form of unions or um, in the cases where a union isn't applicable. So in cases where the repression is too intense, so workers organize in a different way or like with the fair food program, you know, farm workers in the United States are legally not allowed to be part of a union. So they are part of a worker organization. So whatever form that is, something denoting worker leadership is an interesting idea. Um, but I think when we focus on the labeling for consumers piece of it, we, we distract from the working for workers piece of it, which is really where we need the energy. Yeah, that's great. Does anybody else want to come in on that? Okay. Um, well, I, I think that currently looks like that's the end of the questions that we've got here. Um, so we'll bring this to a, a conclusion. Um, I'd just like to sort of thank all of the panellists for their insight, um, giving up their time, um, and also the work and their efforts to improve the industry. Um, I'm sure everybody who's watched this, um, including us, will leave this event um, with more knowledge, as well as hopefully more hope for the future. Um, please be sure to follow all of the work of our panellists online. Um, I think we've put um, all of the links in, in the chat, this video. Um, and also follow No Sweat online on Facebook and all the usual social media channels, more events like this in the future. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you again, to all of the panelists for giving up their time and uh, video conferencing in from all over the world to be here. I think there's some questions on Facebook. <laughs> Sorry, if we had another one come through. I've, well, I've, oh. Oh, just bear with me. Um, are there any existing uh, legal binding agreements or initiatives you would recommend we endorse? Yes, I tried to respond to that one with a link, but I don't know if I did it successfully. Um, but I would direct everyone to our website. We have a page where we list all of the worker-driven social responsibility programs that exist and link to more information about that. Um, if someone can help me drop that in, that would be great. Okay, cool. Um, if you want to send that other to this chat and I can drop it into the one. Yeah, just before before we go, I just uh, what would like to highlight, you know, something we mentioned earlier, like the consumer responsibility. I mean, I'd like to, to further highlight on this. Um, as a business school professor, I would say actually, uh, uh, we are the consumer, who are the consumers? Consumers, you know, so went to university, we'll go to university, you know, one group. So, so we all in, in the West. So, so, so our schooling system, our schooling curriculum from primary school to university levels, um, we have lackings of, uh, you know, curriculum focusing on corporate social responsibility, focusing on moral issues. So now the business school, we are trying to, incorporate, uh, we are redesigning, uh, you know, the curriculum focusing on, uh, you know, different issues uh, of corporate responsibility. So it is now being started, but the future managers, and if they do not know, you know, 
of uh, the moral issues and 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 corporate social responsibility issues. Um, uh, then, you know, how could uh, they behave socially responsibly? At the same time, consumers. Um, so, they the university is a great center. School is a great center to learn. You know how to behave socially responsibly as an individual. Mm. So that, I mean. We need to change our education system somehow. I mean, it is a broader agenda. I mean, at the school school level, when I see my children now going to primary school and learning, you know, the environmental stuff and climate change issues, it's just beginning. I mean, there will be a change, hopefully, in the future. Uh, so the, the universities are considering seriously, schools are considering seriously how to re redesign their curriculum, you know, focusing on uh, responsible issues. Thank you. It's great. I think, yeah, and we've got, we've got one final question here now. I am actually correct in saying this one's the final question. Um, so it, it's basically asking if there are any um, existing legal binding agreements or initiatives you'd recommend that um, we look at and endorse. Um, and also linked in with that is a question about what the panel thinks specifically of the Fair Wear Foundation. Does anybody want to come in on that? I'm happy to, on, on the Fair Wear Foundation, uh, they are within the, um, I would say, have a look at our report, uh, the Not Fit for Purpose report, um, which I think has been shared somewhere on the, the materials, but yeah. Um, uh, so feel free to kind of like dig in there for, for more. Uh, you know, I think they are a multi-stakeholder initiative. So they're amongst what we looked at. And so they do suffer broadly speaking from all of the issues and critiques I've kind of set out there. That said, I think amongst these initiatives, they're probably at the better end. Um, so, so that's that's where I would position them. They, they're structurally very, very limited. There's been major problems pointed to Fairware. Um, but if you were to compare Fairware to say other initiatives in the apparel sector, they're gonna come up looking better. So take that information and do what you will with it. I think if you look at the recent development, I mean, European Union you know, had regulation, I think law a few months ago about mandatory human rights due diligence which is quite fascinating progress so far. I, I would say this is the latest progress on, you know, um, uh, corporations cannot, you know, enter another country and get impunity, you know, if they violate human rights somehow. So that's actually, I find in the latest version, but I do not see actually, you know, this is free from criticism, but I think it is, it is, it is a good way forward. That's great. Okay, I guess on that note, um, officially, thank you everyone once again. Um, yeah, I've so much to think about tonight based on everybody's kind of unique, diverse experiences and knowledge and hope everyone else has as well. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Have a good evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.